Psalm 107, verses 23 to 31. Okay, I'll not wait. Let's go. Please follow my Bibles. Let those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens, they go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brings them out of their distress. He calms the storms, so that the waves are still. Then they are glad, because they are quiet. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. Let us pray. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for your love and mercy towards us. We thank you that you are merciful for your mercies. You are a compassionate God, creator of the universe, creator of all things, visible and invisible. And today, dear Lord, as I stand before your people, dear God, I feel unworthy. But touch my lips, dear God, and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be accepted to you, dear God. And as a result of this message today, dear Father, we'll be drawn closer to you and trust you more dearly. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I have entitled my message today that the Lord placed on my mind. Even the winds obey. According to Genesis chapter 1, the firmament, which is comprised of the, the atmosphere around the earth, was created on the second day of the week. But what is wind? Wind is the movement of air caused by the uneven heating of the earth, or it is the moving mass of air from high pressure areas to low pressure areas. The greater the difference in the pressure of the air, the faster the flow. Winds are defined according to their strength and their duration. For the past couple of weeks, we in South Florida, we have been noticing they are having gusts of wind. A gust lasts just a short time. It can be very strong. It can be devastating at times too. A breeze is a light, gentle wind, which we find so welcoming and soothing, especially on a hot summer day. A very strong wind that lasts a long time can be destructive. It leads to storms and hurricanes. For us in South Florida, people in the Gulf Coast areas have witnessed at least one hurricane. Then there were winds and tornadoes, which is really whirlwind that are connected to thunderstorms. Although winds can become violent and destructive, mankind from ancient times has found ways to harness their energy to use to their advantage. For example, sailboats, windmills, gliders, 
and in the 21st century, we know that wind is a clean source of energy that is used, that can be used to generate electricity instead of fossil fuel. Today, we will look at two narratives in the scriptures that clearly shows and remind us that the Almighty God is the supreme ruler of the universe, even the wind. The first narrative we look at is generally referred to as the crossing of the Red Sea. But before we go to that story, let's spend a couple of minutes looking at the background to this story. The children of Israel were in Egypt as slaves for approximately 400 years. This was prophesied from the time of Abraham, way back. They were not there by chance. God knew what would happen. And I guess parents would tell their children from one generation to the other, and they, they cried to the Lord, it was time for them to be delivered. What was, it, what was the promise? The Lord would return them to the land of Canaan, the promised land, okay? The land of Canaan, Exodus 3, verse 8, verse 8, 17 and 18. We can find that there, that's the destination, a land flowing with milk and honey. God called Moses and told him, that he, God, wanted Moses to bring the people out of Egypt. Our all-knowing and omnipotent God knew how important and significant it was to use a man, his servant Moses, to deliver the people. Although we see that God was the ultimate deliverer working through his prophet Moses. Doesn't this remind us of the incarnate Son of God who came to this world to deliver us from the slavery of sin? Please send your Bibles with me now to Exodus chapter 13, verses 17, 18, and 21. Exodus 13, verses 18 says, let's go from verse 17. Then it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, let perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God let the people around the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. Verse 21, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. Who was leading the way? God. Did they have any physical evidence that God was with them? Yes. The pillar of cloth by day and the pillar of fire by night. According to Exodus 12, 37, 
there were about 600,000 men beside children that left Egypt. And also a mixed multitude followed with them. And we know the mixed multitude were some Egyptians too. Followed just because of curiosity. We all know that. We see that when there are movements, maybe um, revolutions or anything, there are some people who are will join in because they are curious or they like the excitement. And maybe there are some friends of the Israelites too. Before Moses was given the permission by the great Pharaoh to let the children go, as the Lord requested, God allowed nine plagues to fall on Egypt. But the arrogant Pharaoh had his heart. He would not let Israel go. Until the night of the Passover, when the angel of death passed over, and the firstborn, including his first son, the crown prince, was slain. Then in the night, he called for Aaron and Moses, and he said, Come. Take these people, your people, and go. Leave. Hurry. And he ended with this verse, with these words. And bless me also. Do you think that was a genuine request? Or it was just out of fright? Well, I think he was afraid he would be the next one to go to die. Let us look now at Exodus chapter 14. And I'm going to read. Please follow me in your Bibles. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn and camp before Pahirot, between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephron, you shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will get honor over Pharaoh and over his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Verse 5. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made his stirrups, and took his people with him. Also he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. Verse 8 again, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness. So, verse 9, The Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them, camping by the sea, beside Pai Kahirot before Baal Zephon. So, imagine what was happening. These Israelites provided free labor for Egypt. And now, 
They were going away. She was, ah, no, 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 no. I guess he and his officials say, no, the people might get on us. The Egyptian might turn on them, right? Because they don't used to work now. We have people who work for us. And they might look at him as a weak king, right? But Pharaoh saw all the mighty acts of God, but that didn't affect him at all. He had his heart. When the Israelites saw the Egyptian approaching, they were afraid. So they cried out to the Lord. Psalm 50 verse 15 says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. There were some, however, who started to malign Moses and even said that it was, would have been better if they had remained in Egypt than to die in the wilderness. Did Moses reprimand them? No, I don't think so. His faith in God gave him the confidence to say in verse 13 of the same chapter, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you will see no more forever. Continue. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And continue to verse 15. God told Moses to tell the children of Israel to go forward. And God said to Moses, Lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I will hurl the pharaohs, the hearts of the Egyptians, sorry, and they shall follow them. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Question. Was there any power in Moses' rod to divide the sea? No. Moses' rod can be compared to prayer. What am I saying? Anybody disagree with me? Okay. One of our inspired writers, servant of the Lord, wrote, and I read, prayer is a key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotence. The rod in Moses' hand was like prayer. It was in the hand of Moses, a man who had faith in the omnipotent God. What do we mean? Uh, what does it mean by the hardening of the heart? First, we know that the Bible writers use several metaphors and symbols so that people, you and me, can understand or see things clearly. You know that a picture a picture says a thousand words. So we can picture something, we'll understand it better. So the heart here doesn't refer to the organ in our chest that pumps the blood. Instead, it means where you think, make choices and feel emotions. Where is that? Your mind. 
In Matthew 12, 24, Jesus said, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And in Psalm 119, verse 11, it's written, Your word I have hidden in my heart, that I may not sin against you. Okay, so how is that spiritual heart or how is that heart? Now for the explanation. When God sends a person's light through his word, through his mighty acts, through the Holy Spirit, and that person becomes insensitive, insensitive to his sins, his heart becomes hardened. Here's an analogy. If I take a half pound pat of butter and a half pound clump of very soft clay and place both of them in the sun, after a while, the butter will get soft and melt. However, the clay will get hard and dry. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. John 16, verse 8. And Romans 2, verse 4 says, The goodness of God leads us to repentance. Because God made us as free moral agents, when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, we have a choice. We can either repent or reject Him. And when we keep on rejecting, our heart is hardened. Do you know that there is a malady referred to as the hardening of the heart, the heart that pumps the blood? This cardiac muscle in your chest. Hardening of the heart is referred to as calcification of the heart. Calcium, the same mineral that causes the bones to be hard or tough, that's why, and strong, can cause the, flex the flexible tissues of the heart and blood vessels to stiffen. This affects the heart's ability to pump the blood. Can you picture what will eventually happen to an individual who has a classification of the heart? Then, pause for a minute. What do you think will happen to someone whose spiritual heart is hard. Let's go back to the story. Let's go back to the story. Verse 15, same chapter. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up their rod and stretch it over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go and drag ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of Egypt. And I read that already. Okay, let's look at verse 19. And the angel of God, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. God was saying, look out, don't worry, I have your back. 
He's saying the same thing to us. He knew. What's in front? They don't know. Move forward in faith, children. Don't worry. The enemy is behind, but I'm between you and them. Don't worry. I have their back. Verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. Think about it. This verse of the first verse of a contemporary song says, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. Yes, he'll make a way for me. With God, all things are possible. And you see, what he used? Things that he made. He could have just said, water, divide. But he used something. He command the east wind, cut a power. He's interested to know. One day I was sitting there and I said, oh, okay. God could have caused a low tide. Yeah. But the skeptics today, you know what they say? Oh, it was just coincident that on that night was low tide. And then a high tide returned later. But thank God. Because it says here, verse 22, So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea and the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left hand. So it was not like, like a low tide where the water went that way, and then the shore was here, they could walk across. The part was cut like the corridor here, Drag right around here, the sea piled up on this side, a wall of water, and a wall of water on this side, and they were able to walk on the dry ground. Looking on both sides, wall of water. Miracle. God is a God of miracles. No. Somebody said, God is a God of humor. Yeah. <laughs> Look at verse 24. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians to a pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, on their chariots, and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the water returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained, but the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt, so the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord 
and his servant Moses. <laughs> well, what did they learn from that miracle? They learned that the Lord is kind and merciful and it strengthened their faith in him and also in his servant Moses. Did it end there? Were they grateful? Of course they were. The next chapter said that Moses led them in singing and praises to God. And then Miriam, his sister, joining with the women in dancing and also in singing, praising God for his miraculous, for his victory. His victory. Yes, it was God's victory and their miraculous deliverance. Okay. Let's look at the second story. Because I said I have two narratives. And then we'll go very quick. The second narrative is entitled Jesus Calms the Storm. That's the one I asked them to put the, the verses on the screen. Mark, for, it is recorded in three, in three of the gospel. But we are going to use Mark chapter 4, 35 to 41. It says, on the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And there woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? There are several things that these two narratives have in common. First one, I'm going to Share six with us. Six. First one. The Lord chose the destination for the journey. For the Israelites, destination was Canaan, the promised land. And the destination for the disciples, the other side of the lake. Number two. The Lord was present with them. With both groups, the Lord was present. Number three, both groups experienced a situation where they became afraid of impending death. Number four, both cried out to the Lord and he delivered them from their trouble. Number five, faith and lack of faith was demonstrated in both groups. Moses showed his faith in God when he told the children of Israel that God would fight their battles for them. It was also shown 
It was also by faith that they walked on the dry ground in the midst of the sea to the other side. Those who verbally attacked Moses demonstrated their lack of faith. Jesus, fully God, fully man, you know that evening he was tired as a man. He went to sleep and was, a, and was at peace during the storm, having the confidence that God, his heavenly Father, would protect him. So, when he was awakened by the disciples, he commanded the wind to stop. And then he questioned the fate of the his disciples. Last one, number six. Powerful winds play an important role in both stories. For the first one, the Lord commanded the wind to divide the sea and to create the dry road in the midst of the sea. The second one, The Lord commanded the unruly wind to be calm, and it obeyed. In both, in both narratives, the winds were obedient to their creator. And now, let me share with us some life applications. First one. As believers in the Lord Jesus, we, the children of Abraham, spiritual Israel, look for a city that has a foundation whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11, verse 10. Number two, our spiritual journey begins at the time we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who delivers us from the bondage of sin. Who the sun, who the sun sets free is free indeed. John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 sums it up very beautifully. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The journey, when will this journey end? The journey will end when we are restored to the image of God in which, which was marred by sin. Another way of putting it, when the character of God is perfected in us, then the spiritual journey. On our journey, we'll be tested. We'll be faced with trials, and temptations. We may reach at a point like some of those people in the first group who wish they had remained in Egypt. But we have comforting assurance from the scripture, from Jesus himself, that will help us to endure. I would like to share two of them with us today. The first one, I would like you to turn the Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. 
1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. It says here, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. And the next one, Hebrews 2.18. Hebrews 2, verse 18. And I think we could read from... As a matter of fact, let's read from verse 16. Hebrews 2, let's look at verse 16. For indeed, he does not give aid to the angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like, the bre like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Verse 18. Try to keep that in this one in memory. For in that he himself had suffered, been tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Okay. Number four. When the Lord performed miracles on our behalf, we should not forget to express our gratitude. We should praise him with singing and with our testimonies. Our testimony doesn't mean, only mean that we get up and sit in church, but we share with others the good things God has done for us, the miracles the Lord has wrought in our lives. It could be in a situation where you lost your job, because of the stand you took for God. And then the adversary might turn and say, oh, oh, what foolishness. Huh? You might be a homeless, you might be on the street. But you pray, and with the support of the community of faith, which is the church, praying and encouraging you. The Lord opens ways. You get a better job. You can use that experience. You can share that experience with others. Tell what good the Lord has done for you and give him praise. In everything, give thanks. Number five, don't allow ego or self to prevent you from allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you. Don't harden your heart like the Egyptians. Avoid a similar fate in the final judgment. Finally, my brothers and sisters, Take this advice found in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. It's a comforting assurance. It helps me. Because at times, I get very anxious. I remember some years ago, when I was diagnosed with hypertension, I got anxious, and that didn't help. You make it worse. Because you get anxious, your blood pressure goes up. And I got anxious to a point when there was a medication they prescribed for me. And after I was taking it, I tried to check out what was it for? And I found out 
Yeah, it never calm you down and make you less anxious. But I found when he said that you could get addicted to it. So I said, ah, no, 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 Lord. I don't even get to tell the doctor I stopped taking this thing. I remember I took all of them and threw them away. And I say, and I look and say, oh, here is the text of the name. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, right now, the whole world is anxious. What is happening in Ukraine? I don't know. There were so many people from Ukraine living here in South Florida. So, and we have many church brothers and sisters here too. We get anxious. God sees and hear our cry. Let's continue praying for them. God said, and we can say, if, when my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. He's not going to forsake you. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Let's keep praying for those people. Let's pray. And, and as we draw closer to the day when Jesus will return, we know that there will be more wars. The heart of men will become more wicked. But keep hope alive. Christ is our hope. My hope is built and nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So, let us keep holding on. Trust God, the Creator. Don't, don't care what happened. Remember, the ruler of the wind is still the king of kings and lords of lords. Let's give him the honor and the glory and praise. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the reminder that you are lord of the universe. You love us. And at those times, we go through trials. Your promise to be with us. Help us not to be discouraged, Lord. Continue to be with those people in Ukraine. We pray also, Father, for those people who doesn't respect life, dear God, because the adversary, the liar, whose job is to kill, to steal, to destroy, is active, knowing that his end is near. But dear God, as your Holy Spirit work on their hearts, may they not be like Pharaoh, who had his heart, but they might be convicted, dear Lord, and repent and turn to you. Because, dear God, Jesus Christ came and died, not for the righteous, but for sinners, even the vilest one. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.